Hello, hello everyone and welcome to tonight's event. My name is Sarah Hallenbeck. I use she, her, her pronouns and I'm the co-owner of Women and Children First. We are one of the last remaining feminist bookstores in the United States. We are so honored today to host this conversation with Liat Ben Mosh, Dean Spade, and Erica Miners in celebration of the release of Decarcerating Disability by Liat Ben Mosh. But first, let us begin by acknowledging that the land on which we are gathered here at the bookstore is the seized occupied territory of the Peoria, the Potawatomi, the Miami, and the Sioux people. As you likely already know, our physical bookstore is closed due to COVID-19, but we are thrilled to be able to gather virtually and continue these connections and conversations during this time of social distancing. I encourage you to join us again on Tuesday, June 23rd at seven o'clock when we will be welcoming Meredith Toulousin for a reading of their new memoir, Ferris. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. I'm gonna put a link in the chat bar for those of you who haven't purchased Liat's book, Decarcerating Disability. Um, you can do so from Women and Children First. I also encourage you to ask a question using the Q&A function in the webinar. Now on to tonight's event. Dean Spade is an associate professor at Seattle University School of Law. Dean is the author of Normal Life, Administrative Violence, Critical Transpolitics, and the Limits of Law. Erica R. Miners is a professor of education and women's and gender studies at Northeastern Illinois University. Erica is the author of a number of books, including Right to be Hostile, Flaunt It, and For the Children. Liat Van Mosh is an assistant professor of criminology, law, and justice at the University of Illinois at Chicago. The author of the Decarcerating Disability, Deinstitutionalization, and Prison Abolition, and the co-editor of the Disability Incarcerated. She is an activist, college scholar, educator, researcher, working at the intersection of incarceration, decarceration, abolition, and disability and madness. Her work is to expand what counts as incarceration to include all carceral, carceral locales and to connect to institutionalization, disability, and mad movements to prison abolition through an intersectional lens. With decarcerating disability, Liet Van Mosh provides groundbreaking case studies that show how abolition is not an unattainable goal, but rather a reality, and how it plays out in different arenas of incarceration. I am so grateful that we are having this conversation right now, as so many of us are coming together and building upon the current momentum to dismantle the failed system of incarceration. Please join me in welcoming Dean Spade, Erica Miners, and Liat Van Mosh. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I want us to, uh, first of all, thank Sarah and Women and Children First Bookstore uh, before COVID, this was supposed to be in real life event um, that they would host us. Um, in, on the way, we learned a lot about technology and how to do this online. Uh, and also, um, we are very blessed to have more people than the bookstore can hold and more people that can join us from around the world. So um, it actually turned out really great. Um, my name is uh, Liat uh, Ben Moshe. Um, for those who can't see me, uh, I'm a femme looking, white appearing uh, person. I'm wearing uh, kind of magenta color. 
um, to fit the cover. See how I did it? Um, of the book, and I'm wearing glasses and uh, lipstick and earrings. And behind me are a bunch of books. Um, a few notes um, before I let Erica and Dean take it away and introduce themselves as well um, is uh, a few notes about Zoom. Uh, you have access to the chat and the Q&A. Uh, if you want to ask us questions, please put it in the Q&A. We can't really look at everything that goes on on the chat. Um, and uh, especially towards kind of the end of today. So just put that in the Q&A. If something's not working, we'll do our best um, to help. So put that, uh, you can put that in the Q&A uh, or the chat as well. And just also help each other. So Erica and Dean. Hi, um, I'm super thrilled to be here. Um, I'm Erica, and um, I'm, a, I'm a white person with brown hair, with glasses, and I'm wearing, of course, a cat print shirt today <laughs> in honor of Liat and Liat's book. Um, and I'm just so excited to be here in conversation um, in this political moment for this important book with Dean and Liat. I also just want to acknowledge um, Women and Children First as an important container in the city for pushing for radical conversations over the last several decades and just all the other collectives and movements that are either listening and uh, participating um, in this conversation today. So I'm really looking forward to a great conversation. Thanks. Um, Dean, before you go, just one more note. Um, there is and um, there are two interpreters. Um, only one will be visible at the time, and there's captioning. So for those who want captioning, um, go down on the CC button. You can look at it either as transcript or as captions. If at any point um, the captioning doesn't work for you or you can't see the interpreters, please let us know in the chat, and we'll try to fix that. Um, it's also being broadcasted on YouTube. Um, the captioning either works or doesn't work there, but um, there's a link to it on the chat if people want to try it out. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm Dean Spade. I'm talking to you all from Duwamish Territory in Seattle, Washington. Um, and I am a white person with a mustache and a red shirt that kind of matches Liet's. And um, yeah, I'm talking to you all from my home and there's a map of the watershed I live in behind me on the wall. Um, and I'm so excited to be at this event. I, I love Liat's book. I've learned so much from her work and um, also from Erica's. And it's just a real treat to like be in conversation with people who um, have taught me so much and who um, I just admire and trust their analysis really deeply and get to learn um, in, this, in this Zoom conversation. We've never done this before. So this is how things are now. And I'm glad to be here with all of you while they're like this. And thanks to everyone who put all the logistics of this event together. Great, so we're gonna start with a reading. Um, usually that's kind of the bulk of the event, but today um, it will be, uh, I guess more 10 or 15 minutes of a reading, and then we're gonna go into a conversation. Does that sound about right to everybody? All right. All right, so, um, uh, Tina and Heidi, I'm going to read mostly verbatim from what I sent you. Okay, so this is from the introduction and um, the conclusion of the book. So to those who claim that prison abolition and massive decarceration are utopian, um, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, <laughs> it's in my notes that we are hosted by the University of Minnesota Press, which is the press that um, uh, published this book. Um, so uh, thank you for having the confidence in this book and also helping to do a lot of the uh, behind the scenes of this reading today. All right. To those who claim that prison abolition and massive decarceration are utopian and could never happen, this book shows that they've happened already, although in a different arena 
in the form of mass closures of residential institutions and psychiatric hospitals and the deinstitutionalization of those who resided in them. I suggest that it's essential to interrogate the institutionalization as a social movement, a mindset, a logic to counter carceral logic. I argue that deinstitutionalization is not just something that happened, but was a call for an ideological shift in the way we react to difference among us. Therefore, one aim of the book is to construct and activate a genealogy of the largest decarceration movement in US history, deinstitutionalization. Understanding how to activate this knowledge can lead to more nuanced actions towards and understandings about reducing our reliance on prisons and other carceral enclosures. In so doing, we can build coalitions between queer, racial justice and disability justice organizing. I'm going to skip a sentence. By understanding deinstitutionalization as a history of abolitionist practices, I argue that deinstitutionalization is not only a historical process, but a logic. It was something that the people fought for and won. It was and still is a fraught process, but it is also a cautionary tale of success. This interpretation showcases the gains that deinstitutionalization made in the ways we treat disability and madness. And I mean treatment in both uh, as the ter as I mean treatment both in terms of the impetus to therapeutically take care of disability, now take care outside of institutional walls, but also treatment in terms of social and culturally, a shift in perspective towards disability rights, inclusion, and perhaps justice. By viewing the institutionalization in this way. This book brings to the forefront the social critiques that disability and madness conjured up regarding treatment, rehabilitation, choice, and segregation. But the book also offers critiques of deinstitutionalization and the ways it helped to construct a narrow liberal approach to liberation through the framework of inclusion by adhering to specific able, racial, gendered capitalist formations. If neoliberalism is, as Grace Hong describes, a change in the distribution of respectability in response to the crisis in racial capital, as marked by the social movements of the post-World War II period, then incorporation is one of its key characteristics. Therefore, throughout the book, I use the concept of this ink, D I S, ink I and C, to expand this logic to two aspects of neoliberalism disability incarcerated and disability incorporated. I'm using the word incorporation to signal both the cultural and social incorporation of minority difference into the status quo and incorporation as a structure of political economic profit-making impetuses. I'm going to skip a paragraph. Connecting this to the current moment, by connecting the work of prison abolitionists and theorists who critique the prison industrial complex to disability studies and disability rights, we can begin to understand the ways in which criminalizing entails the construction of both race, especially blackness, and disability, especially mental difference, as dangerous. I do not believe one can be separated from the other. I therefore use race ability as a way to denote this nexus. I also use the framework of racial criminal pathologization, which is about understanding policing, incarceration, and its alternatives as disability issues with everything that that means, from refiguring alternatives to, di to diagnosing the crisis. 
It also entails centering the experiences of disablement and ableism in criminal, racial, and social justice movements. For example, the trauma and disabling effects of detention and incarceration. In the book, I ask what a disability justice or a crip or mad of color critique of incarceration and decarceration would mean. I suggest that race ability is linked to mad and crip of color critique of incarceration and decarceration. And that it is not just about those who identify or are politicized as disabled people of color who are caught up in this system. Although it is really important to recognize the high numbers of disabled men, women, and trans folks, especially those of color, in carceral systems, including policing. Such framework, though, entails theorizing that the disposability of certain populations and their susceptibility to premature death, which is Ruth Gilmore's definition of racism, to understanding the nature of systems of capture and exclusion, to discussing alternatives to these systems, and to envisioning shared horizons. It's also an understanding that anti-Black racism is composed of pathologization and dangerousness, which leads to processes of criminalization and disablement, as we see now in the cases of so-called police brutality, constructing people as other or as deranged, as crazy, illogical, scary, and to be disposed of. Crip or med of color critique and disability justice urge us to move from approaches that look at violence and discrimination as related to individual acts and instead focus through an intersectional lens on systemic issues and structural inequities, inequities. The criminal justice system, psychiatry, and legal-based rights discourse are therefore not seen as the solution to the plight of queer, disabled, or poor people of color, immigrants, or their intersections, but are in fact the source of the problem. Therefore, it is crucial to provide a crip or med of color critique of incarceration and decarceration to center the experiences of disablement and ableism in criminal, racial, and social justice movements, to understand trauma and the disabling effect of detention and incarceration, but also alternatives to incarceration that are proposed and their net effect on increasing ableism and sanism. I wanna move uh, in my last few minutes to um, the end of the conclusion for the book. Throughout the book, I interrogated the cost of incorporation, of inclusion under a racial, settler, ableist set status quo. I wanna end then with caution. What happens when we win? once deinstitutionalization becomes institutionalized? What new forms of confinement came to replace and intersect? And what can decarceration and abolitionary movements in the prison arena learn from deinstitutionalization? There are many critiques, of course, of the idea of institutional abolition in the disability arena, especially for reformers. I want to give, for example, I want to end with the example of the, what I called, um, what people call the continuum approach. This approach views residential edu and educational placement of disabled people as a continuum with segregated congregate facility, meaning institutions, on one side and supported living in one's home on the other side. And in between, there's a lot of different options. In other words, it supports the idea that a segregated facility should be one of a variety of options in which people with disability can and should reside. And this is a very important lesson from deinstitutionalization as a logic of desegregation. 
the neoliberal choice model of the free market makes it appear as if all choices on this continuum are equally valid. But ultimately, institutionalization is not a choice. It should never be a choice, not for the worker in discursive facilities, not for parents of disabled people, not for our collective imagination. Institutionalization, in fact, is state-sponsored violence against people with disabilities, many of whom are currently people of color and elderly. Therefore, what disability rights activism can learn from the arena of abolition is also the importance of anchoring struggles in the analysis of state violence, as well as the need to understand abolition as a form of what I call dis-epistemology, needing to let go of particular ways of knowing. Only when the institutional model is no longer viable for anyone can new alternatives grow, get traction and funding and gain legitimacy. This then might be the deepest lesson from deinstitutionalization. The only way to do it effectively is to not institutionalize people in the first place. In other words, decarceration could be closer to abolition as a measure of not just harm reduction, but actual prevention, creating a non-carceral non world through preventing new admissions and new carceral facility construction. The people who benefit the most are those who will never have to experience the horror of such places. To end, the consequences of inclusion of minority difference via assimilation and commodification are also bringing new forms, strategies, and analysis for liberation. As the title of the book suggests, Decarcerating Disability, decarceration in the form of deinstitutionalization and prison abolition should be thought of as linked. As I suggest in the book, there is an urgent need to understand the disabling and maddening effect of carceral sites, including jails and prisons, as not only segregating and incarcerating disability or madness, but as sites of disablement, meaning even if you don't go in them disabled, you, you will come out, if you do come out disabled, which is biopolitical form um, which, I'm sorry, which means they are sites of targeted debilitation, as Jasbir Puar suggests, which is a political form of state violence. As I further urge in the book, this targeted debilitation needs to be countered in a non ableist and intersectional way, one that understands the lived form of disablement, meaning disability as political. The goal then would be not only to capture disability when it's weaponized by the state, but to mobilize disability collectives and movements for the service of abolition. For those who are already invested in projects of prison abolition and radical liberation, I hope that an immersion in mad and disabled histories and knowledges like the ones I provide here will facilitate a greater coalitional struggle and more nuanced tactics and analysis. Are you ready to be asked a question by us yet? Okay, great. Um, Thank you so much. That was amazing. I encourage everybody to read the entire book, obviously, because that's just the littlest taste of all of the, I learned so many things in this book. Um, but I was really curious about um, asking you to reflect on the current moment of rebellion against police violence that's happening. Um, I feel like it's been a repeated theme in your work and, and in um, the work of disability activists for a long time um, that people with disabilities are particularly targeted by police that for violence of all kinds and that um, that's a really missing lens often in terms of the way we talk about um, that violence and it may make us misunderstand 
um, both causes and consequences and um, potential paths forward. And so I was just curious if you could share um, what you think a focus on disability would add to the current conversation. Yeah, that's a, a really great question. Um, and, and really a question that's, you know, best answered in collective <laughs> um, kind of thinking. Um, but I would just say a few things. One is about um, the funding and alternatives and kind of uh, people who are newcomers to abolition, um, welcome. Um, I mean, I think it's a moment in which the the movement for abolition is growing, the movement to defend black lives is growing, um, the, movement, the movement to defund the police is growing. And I think for a lot of us, those are the same things, but I'm not sure that for all people, it's the same things. And if we bring disability um, into it, I, I wanna also say uh, from the get-go that, and I think that that's really also what you mean, but in the book, when I say disability, I mean it very broadly. Um, so I talk about deinstitutionalization, particularly in the fields of intellectual disability and um, psychiatric disability. Um, and I'm just putting it out there because oftentimes when we say disability, people mean people in wheelchairs. Um, and um, that's, of course, a very narrow kind of interpretation of disability and uh, interpretation that disability rights historically have fallen under. Um, so I want to um, say that when we bring disability broadly defined, one of the things we can see um, is what I called in the book, carceral sanism. Uh, let me give you an example. So there's all these um, memes and things going on now that how we need to defund the police and instead invest in mental health alternatives. And we need to invest in more social workers and we need um, when you call 911, it needs to be a social worker or a professional that comes in to check on you and not a cop. Well, a lot of people in anti-psychiatry have had long-standing critiques about that practice, about what does it mean that a social worker comes to check on you, uh, what happens after the check, um, what are people, um, uh, that the check is always intertwined with biopsychiatry. Um, and again, this is not a call for people to not take their medicines anymore or anything like that. The anti-psychiatry movement, med movements are very, very nuanced. It's not a monolithic movement. But what I mean by carceral sanism is that disability and madness get weaponized in this discourse towards reform, as if it's done in our name, um, as if we're asking people who are survivors, for example, people who are have labels of intellectual disabilities, people who are disabled or politicized as disabled, as if we're asking for it. And for the most part, we are not asking for it. We are, and this is the history of the institutionalization, have been asking for the opposite of it. We have been asking to be liberated from professionals. We've been asking to be liberated from biopsychiatry um, and so on. So um, to use that to say this is reform, this is better than policing. This is about defending black lives. Um, this is of course um, not how history has worked. And this is of course not uh, how uh, the movements uh, are talking about what they are calling liberation and have been calling liberation for um, a few decades now. Um, the other thing that I would say uh, is that uh, and then I, I want to hear what you uh, all have to say, is that the movement um, to defend Black Lives, the uh, Black Lives um, Matter movement, and so on, you know, there has been um, not the best synergies always with uh, disability movements and disability justice movements. I do think we're in a different moment now than we were four years ago uh, when the Movement for Black Lives wrote its initial platform. Um, I do think there's more kind of coalitional efforts. I do think that there's more focus on access and disability justice. I, I still think there could be much, much, much more. And just as one example, if people, I, I really don't recommend that you watch this movie, but um, if people have seen the movie Bedlam, B-E-D-L-A-M, which um, was on PBS, um, 
one of the people featured there is the brother of one of the founders of Black Lives Matter. Um, but the movie really ends with, uh, you know, a call for, um, which is the National Alliance of Mental Illness, for example, or the Treatment Advocacy Center, call for more institutions, um, more medication, and so on and so on. And so I think we need to be really wary, not just people, like I started um, today by saying people who are new to abolition, but also people who are new to disability, people who are new to madness. Disability and madness are political movements. They're political identities too. Not everybody has been politicized, including us. A lot of us disabled people have not been politicized. Uh, and so I hope that we learn also our own history. Uh, our own history of oppression, our own history of resistance. And I think that's kind of what disability or madness can add. Thank you so much, Liat. And I'm just, um, I'm also just encouraging people to get the book, to read it. Um, I've learned, I continue to learn so much from being in conversation with you, being in struggle with you. And um, I'm just excited to be in this conversation today. So I'm going to, um, sort of continue with that um, idea of, of critical histories and histories um, and engaging kind of counter genealogies, which the project is. I learned something about you through the project um, that you're a historian. <laughs> um, um, so I really appreciated that. But the book is this genealogy of the largest decarceration movement in US history, deinstitutionalization. Can you talk more, I mean, again, in this political moment, about why that historical intervention is so imperative now? Why this counter genealogy? What was the, how was the story of deinstitutionalization told? Um, and why, um, and why the imperative of this political abolitionist reading in this moment? Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for that. And feel free to jump in as if you're not like amazing activists that are also embedded in these movements or anything. Um, but I think it, it was really important for me to look at this as a historical moment. Um, and the historical moment is also different between intellectual developmental disabilities and psych disabilities. Um, it's about 15 years difference in the US between the deinstitutionalization of one and the other. Um, but oftentimes when we talk about disability rights, um, when we talk about liberation struggles of the 60s and 70s, I have yet to see deinstitutionalization as part of any of those discussions. And so it was really important for me to kind of bring that into the forefront of those uh, discussions, both the disability world and liberation struggles more broadly. Uh, a lot of the resistance to deinstitutionalization came from people who were also, um, you know, uh, anti-war activists um, and, and so on and so on. And so that's, that's one thing. But the story as it's been told is really a story of abandonment and failure, right? It's not a story of liberation. It's a story of um, deinstitutionalization happened people ended up in the streets, they ended up in jails and prisons. Of course, we have so many people who are mentally ill in jail and prisons. Um, and there's always this, of course, kind of logic to this narrative. And so as a critical person, that's what I jump on, right? Is like, what do you mean, of course? Um, and, you know, as somebody who's trained in the social sciences, maybe unfortunately, um, I can also do that research <laughs> to look at the the kind of, of course, you know, kind of what, what did happen at that time. Uh, and this is not to say that abandonment was not a part of what happened, but the, the forces of abandonment were not from the institutionalization activists that were um, not accountable to their community or were utopian or left people to die. It was because of um, policies that left people to die and not just disabled people. It was the complete decimation of the welfare state at the exact same time that law and order policies began. And so this is why we see so many people in jails and prisons. It's not because the institutionalization failed. 
and why it matters is because now people are calling for reinstitutionalization, whether it's literally in psych hospitals, which some people want, you know, there's calls to bring back the asylums, or it's through these kind of alternatives like halfway homes and uh, group homes and all of these kind of measures. So it's incredibly important, important to tell a different history because the conclusions you reach is the institutionalization is a social, was a social movement, is a social movement, it's a logic. And it's a logic that's very similar to prison abolition. And in fact, is very interconnected to prison abolition and its history and its formation. So I think all of those are, are really, really uh, meaningful for the current moment as well. I'm curious to um, to hear you, you know, reflect also on the aspect of the current moment that's about COVID-19. I think a lot of the most um, vigorous um, prison abolition activism we've all been seeing in, in the period leading up to the George Floyd's death and the current anti-police rebellion was all of this work to try to get people released and the Free Them All campaign, the Free Them All for Public Health. And yet we've seen in many ways a real lack of responsiveness and a lack of releasing people and because your work really looks at medical authority, pathologization, um, uh, incarceration, I'm just curious, like how you reflect on this particular moment um, of that of that resistance and of the um, you know refusal to release people. Um, yeah, just like how you're thinking about this. Yeah, um, and just heads up, I'm going to throw that question to you too. So. Yeah, why aren't we, I mean, for real, you've been a part of the Freedom Mall and all of that. And it's a question I've been asking from the beginning is, and a lot of us were. I mean, I think there was a moment at the beginning of the epidemic where a lot of us were like, finally, everybody will wake up and realize how awful these places are. And surely even whatever governors or other people would be, um, at least compassionate releases, you know, and so on and so on. Um, as I'm sure you know, things like compassionate release from prison has been a, a complete defunct practice uh, on two levels. One is it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, and uh, just statistically and otherwise, it's so, um, it's so few and far between. And the second thing is it's, it's quite ableist. I mean, and people who are um, really kind of radical lawyers who are using this tactic are, are aware of this, but it's one of those things that you kind of have to do in order to release a person. You really have to make them as um, close to death and as pathetic and dependent as possible so that the judge will understand that, you know, there is absolutely no way that this person is dangerous anymore and that, you know, they're just going to go home and die. And this has happened, you know, Herman Wallace and people literally get released and, you know, three days later they die. Um, so that's about, you know, compassionate release. But I think what bothers me the most about um, these campaigns is not just that they um, don't, didn't work, which is what bothers me the most, um, but that they don't take into account incarceration kind of writ large, right? So for a lot of us who do this work, um, including the, the first book I edited, uh, Disability Incarcerated, we look at incarceration as something that happens in a variety of locations, um, a variety of campaigns and so on. It's not just something that happens in jails and prisons, but also in nursing homes. You know, congregate facilities now uh, comprise almost half of the COVID deaths almost half, uh, in, I'm, I'm using Illinois as an example. And so if we um, decarcerate both in nursing homes, um, in institutions, in psych facilities, in jails and prisons, we can reduce COVID by half, probably more actually, but let's say half. And that is not enough, it seems, for people who hold institutions and nursing homes and jails and prisons at something so sacred and something that there's nothing beyond it. Like, of course, we're not going to decarcerate because 
what else is there, right? So I think the current moment and the COVID moment are so important because the abolitionary imag imagination is starting to kind of expand that. Um, and so I see a complete intersection between those two questions that you just asked. I also think it's really important in addition to understanding kind of the arc of incarceration or what I call in the book, the um, carceral industrial complex, you know, meaning institutions and prisons and other sites, is that they're not analogies, analogies, meaning um, a lot of activists are like, okay, I understand how to do this because I was in this arena. They are connected. People go in and out of these places. So it's not just that uh, one, you know, is here and the other one is here and they're um, go in parallel lines, like they actually are uh, intersecting. And that's why I think it's so imperative for uh, people who do prison work to be more disability, um, culturally competent, right? Um, and vice versa, because the struggle is interconnected. The resistance has to be doubly interconnected. But yeah, I don't have an answer particular answer to you know why it has not happened why <laughs> i um i wonder if it also has something to do with proximities to innocence too um as well and uh, I mean, I just think yeah, the inability to get public, um, pu the public to pay attention to people dying inside. I mean, I think it, it also has something to do with the category of the criminal that that, you know, deeply racialized anti black artifact and also its associations with, you know, bad, bad people. Right. And I think policing is interrelated with that, but there's also a measure of, I mean, I think, you know, a measure of, 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 of an attachment of innocence to it. I think that, you know, as we think a little bit about the strategies around sort of reform and abolition in this moment, where and how, you know, proxies for innocence erupt, I think is a really important thing to try to tr track and chase. So yeah. Um, and I, I think also, um, you know, just your book, I'm thinking about the strategies around um, organizing. I mean, I, I love the sort of uh, critique of litigation in there. So I'm gonna shift here and ask you to um, talk a little bit about, because one of the big takeaways for me is also not just that it's this amazing critical history, um, a history that we need to know, but also sort of this, um, um, a book about strategy, a book about tactics, um, and it's about collectives and organizations and groups and networks. So I'm wondering if you can um, maybe take a minute and talk a little bit about the limits of litigation as a strategy, what it might reinforce and reify, um, and maybe um, maybe one of the many examples um, of kind of collectives or groups or networks um, doing something that's not a strategy based on litigation. This was also one of the questions that came up in the um, Q and A too. Yeah, thanks for keeping an eye on the Q&A. Um, so um, there's a whole chapter in the book that I devote to litigation. And what I do in that chapter, um, first of all, I connect the history of um, in what is called institutional reform litigation to the history of prisoners' rights um, litigation which was um, mostly in the 70s and, and then the 80s. Um, and this is another arena where things have happened at the same time, but there was not a lot of connections between those two things, even though the strategies were quite similar. Um, and so a lot of it was basically class action lawsuits around conditions of confinement and conditions of confinement for people with um, intellectual disabilities, um, especially in these massive, massive institutions. I don't know if people can even fathom. Um, today, I think for younger people, when we say institutions, they think, oh, you know, like a hundred people, but these were thousands of people in one institution and with very little staff. 
So conditions of confinement were horrific. And of course, conditions of confinement, as we learned um, by the Attica uprising and by this history of litigation, were also horrific in uh, prisons and jails. And the bottom line, um, the, the, I'm sorry, the, the third thing that I do before I get to the bottom line in that chapter um, is to also discuss um, kind of like the second chapter of prison litigation, which a lot of it has to do with um, feminist struggles for litigation or gender-based, um, I should say, um, struggle for liberation through litigation, which has a lot to do with women, women as parents, uh, um, uh, people who give birth in women's facilities, and then um, also just the issue of gender, I mean, trans prisoners and so on. And so the era of prisoners' rights has not necessarily ended, it just kind of transformed. And because it transformed into uh, women and gender non-conforming people, people assume that it did end because we don't have this kind of like George Jackson figure, but we have a lot of really strong women, right? Um, uh, but that doesn't count as much uh, as we know. So that's what I do in that chapter. But the bottom line is that um, this litigation around conditions of confinement, and this is also my um, analysis of exposés as well, which are kind of related to that, is that they're really helpful in mobilizing people. And again, I think activist lawyers, of course, know this. They're very helpful in mobilizing people, but they're not actually helpful in abolition. And they're not actually helpful in getting people out a lot of the times. Um, they're not um, useful for abolition because they often result in reforms. So people are really upset about conditions of confinement and they do exposés and they call a journalist and journalists come with the camera and now even uh, people are incarcerated themselves, you know, tape their daily lives and everybody, this is what is happening in COVID um, as well now in nursing homes, for example, in prisons, and everybody's horrified. And then there's a lawsuit. Um, but then what? Then sometimes there's a reform, so that facility does something a little bit different. Um, and this is what uh, Rachel Herzig, H-E-R-Z-I-G, uh, calls uh, tweaking Armageddon, which I really love. I mean, it's exactly what it is. You just kind of tweak it, but that's not abolition. And so the critique of litigation is that it's, it's very hard to use it as an abolitionary strategy, unless you think about it as just another way to collectivize people, people who are incarcerated, for example, um, people incarcerated with uh, allies outside, for example. And as that, it is, um, you asked about strategies, it is a useful strategy, um, but it's not an abolitionary strategy. But I don't know if, if Dean, you have a different take on it since this, this is a lot of what you do. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think that um, for the most part, litigation and like changing the law doesn't end up changing vulnerable people's lives very much. It often changes like what it's called or like the external wrapping on it, right? That's, I think, in the history of looking at big legislative or litigation challenges to big problems in, in U.S. law, it's, it's usually not um, shaken out with the results people want. Um, and sometimes it builds the systems, especially with lawsuits about different forms of incarceration, because it means that more resources maybe are supposed to be added to give people something they weren't getting. Um, so I think that's a question that lawyers um, and lawyers working it with other people in movements have to ask, like, if we won, would, it, would this be enforced? Because most things that pe are people's like, rights are not enforced. And um, if we won, would this expand or, or shrink the system? And so I think that's always a question, like, is there, are there ways to do litigation that take, that shrink or take tools out of the toolbox of the system? Um, and I think that's often not the case. And I think litigation can be demobilizing too because people like think the problem has been solved or, um, or think like the lawyers are handling it so we don't need to be in the streets because like it's gonna be dealt with um, by lawyers right now. And that, and of course, like courts are unlikely to deliver anything that really 
transforms um, the bottom line of who is vulnerable and whose lives um, are disposable in our um, society. One question that came up in the Q&A that I wanted to put to you, Liat, was um, someone asks, can you talk more about alternatives to congregate facilities and examples? Yeah, um, that's the question, you know, that gets raised the most. Um, I think when all of us do these kind of talks is, okay, what, what are you suggesting? <laughs> you know, like, I buy your critique, your critique is amazing. And I wish we lived in that world, but we don't live in that world. So uh, I'm not saying that's what the this person who asked uh, is actually asking, but I, I think that's kind of the what gets asked the most. And um, I want to answer it in two ways. One is to say, um, you know, this is a very the question about alternatives. It's very kind of local and strategic and case by case. And this is exactly the problem with congregate facilities like prisons and nursing homes and psych facilities is that they become this, you know, and this is from Angela Davis, they become basically like catch all solutions to very distinct issues that people are having, like being housing insecure, um, being a sex worker. Um, again, not, not necessarily all of it are like bad issues. Um, and so on and so on. So these will require very different approaches. Uh, so there wouldn't be kind of one alternative that we're going to call twinkle or something, and then people would be placed in twinkle instead of in like another place. Um, it's really a radical change in how we do things. It's a radical change to how we, how we react to harm. Um, and this is not to say harm is gonna go away. Um, and this is a call for radical change in how we treat difference. And difference very, very hopefully is not going away either. Uh, well, there's a push, always a push for like eugenics and so on. But, you know, the other way to think about this um, is also to think about it as not an alternative. Um, I think the word itself somehow centers the opposite, right? So an alternative to something is an opposite of something, something that's outside of that something. But I think one of the lessons from the instrumentalization is that people just um, created uh, a vision, even when things were not there. Uh, even when people said, but wait, the community is not ready. How are people going to live in the community? It's not ready. It's never going to be ready. I mean, that is like the, the, the lie of, um, of, of this. Um, and this is why it's really important to push on these moments of not ready and we don't have it and we don't have the answers. These are good moments. These are collective moments. These are community moments in which we come together and get to answer these questions. Um, and um, I mean, what Dean was saying earlier and, and um, Angel Davis and other people call it a process of de-skilling. We, we tend to think that other people will solve these things, right? So instead of calling the police will call a social worker instead of calling 911, we'll call 311 instead of, you know, and so on and so on. But a lot of it just has to do with us learning and skilling ourselves into doing those kind of things. So it's not an alternative. It's, it's a completely different uh, landscape. It's a completely kind of different vision. Um, and, and this is not a cop out either like I know it's very frustrating to hear that that I can't answer that question for everybody like where do I go where does my cousin go my cousin need to get out now and and so on but this is really an action a, a question that needs to end to be answered um, through a collective through a support system you know around that person um, and so on 
I really appreciate that discussion about alternatives. I think it's so um, timely in this political moment as well, um, just to remind us. And I love how the book really um, pushes this, um, you know, pushes us away from that as a, as a language, but as a, as a response, as a sort of conceptual frame. So I think that's just a really important intervention to, to keep reminding ourselves of in relation to the contemporary defund police movement, for example. And the book has so many sort of um, rich uh, examples, I think, that help, right? Um, I'm gonna just go to the Q&A because there's some great questions coming up. So here's one um, from somebody who works in the independent living movement who's talking about um, the tensions about challenging the advocacy of parent advocates in the developmental disabilities community. And I know your book um, raises this as well, so I thought it was a good question to engage. And also in the aging community that actively promote institutionalization. So, um, and their question is, do you see a generational change here? Do you see um, um, any sort of uh, any shifts in this political moment um, versus some of the historical work that you've done? And I think it's also probably a question about how to engage that frame. Yes, such a good question. Um, so for those who are not aware, um, one of the major proponents for institutionalization and also actually deinstitutionalization are parents of people with disabilities, uh, particularly intellectual disabilities and also psychiatrics. Um, so the um, some of the organization I named earlier, uh, NAMI, which is the National Alliance of Mental Illness, um, TAC, which is the um, Treatment Advocacy Center, for example, um, and some groups in the IDD, Intellectual and Developmental Disability world. Um, some of them have terrible names, so I'm not gonna actually name them. Um, it's in the book, um, like really offensive names. Um, they um, support, institutionalization for people with uh, intellectual or psychiatric disability depending on the organization and it's very hard to go against parents because they come to these um, I went to a bunch of like closure hearings for example and you go to these hearings and you have them like mobilized with like t-shirts that say don't kick my daughter from so-and-so facility and pictures and like testimonies. Um, and I think one way to counter that is, um, and, and again, I have a whole chapter about just that, uh, people who resist deinstitutionalization de and decarceration, um, including unions and workers. Um, so I can't answer all of that, but um, uh, it's chapter six for people who are interested. But um, what I would say is that, you know, in disability movements, we know that often what parents, especially if they're non-disabled parents, which is very often the case, what they want for their kids is not necessarily what the kids want. Uh, and the kids are often like in their 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, the people who are now in congregate facilities for people with IDD are aging. So, I also don't want to vilify the parents, the person who asked about aging, their parents are aging and they have this fear of like, if I die, literally what's going to happen to my kid. And all I know is the institution. A lot of these people have been there for decades. And I was told by a doctor, not me specifically, I'm talking about the parents. Um, you know, I was told in the fifties and sixties and so on, that it's the best thing for my kid. So, it's very hard now to counter that, um, to say it's not. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, it's there's so many different um, modalities of, of kind of countering that discourse. And that discourse is often done on a very like effective with an A um, way um, of, you know, you can't really do it for my kid. And one of the things that they use, uh, which is the last thing that I read, is this continuum thing is, okay, um, 
I am not against the industrialization, but it's just not going to work for my kids. So we have to keep it as one choice and it's parents' choice. So one of the things that I say in the book is we need to counter that neoliberal choice model. An institution is not a choice. And if we understand that an institution is violence, and violence is not a choice, a labor camp is not a choice, a detention camp is not a choice, would you go there, you know? So when we take that as a choice, I think we're, we're moving the discourse. Uh, and I think people in the prison arena have been very, very savvy parents, especially black mothers have been very savvy in doing that, shifting the discourse. Uh, my son is not a paycheck. You know, this is not your, this isn't, uh, the, the prison is not there for you to have employment. So I think this is another arena where we can kind of, you know, create coalitions of people who have done it because they're, you know, they're fighting often against the same kind of windmills, the unions and policies uh, and so on. There's a question in the Q&A that relates to what you just said. Um, I'll slow down a little bit. Uh, um, where uh, someone asked about how to fight for abolition. And I'm curious, you've done so much research and also of course you're engaged in contemporary movements and um, about, about moments where you see really inspiring coalitional work or where you see strategy or tactics that feel um, full of possibility for you. Um, obviously your book is also really helpful for helping us see the pitfalls of potential strategies that we could take. But I am curious about um, how, how you think about that question of, of how we do this and where you're seeing um, things you admire. Yeah, um, I really think it's everywhere. Um, so, so the book is really, you know, a lot of it is, is a critique, but a lot of it is just like kind of reimagining the institutionalization, the institutionalization as abolition and imagining abolition as disability centered. Um, so a lot of the work is imaginary, um, but only in the sense that uh, it kind of pushes for a particular um, uh, horizon of thought. Just to give one example, I mean, there's a lot, like you mentioned uh, in the book. A lot of, uh, and I don't even know if I write about it that much in the book, to be honest, but a lot of the really successful facility closure, um, I'm going to um, take a moment to say, a lot of the book is about decarceration and it's about facility closure, both prisons and institutions and site facilities. And I know as an abolitionist, that that's not everything that abolition is. Abolition is not, you know, let's close it down, let, or let's, on the other hand, close it down, open the door, let people out. I mean, that's a very kind of cartoonish understanding of what abolition is. But I do want to say that it's one tactic, and it is the tactic that I mostly talk about in the book, the tactic of decarceration, um, closing it, getting people out, creating um, um, infrastructure on the ground to uh, facilitate that, creating movements to facilitate that, and the failures of doing that and not doing that. So that's what the book um, focuses on. But to give one example, Facility closures in the intellectual disability arena that were done really well, in my opinion, um, in terms of a lot of people um, got not into other settings, but they got into community living settings, um, was done by doing two things. One is this kind of swift measures um, so to kind of, like I said earlier, instead of getting the community ready and this ready and that ready, doing more like a sneak attack, you know, uh, by this day, giving it some time, it's not going to be tomorrow, especially with people with intellectual disabilities that, you know, require support. Um, 
but by this date, this will be closed. From now to this date, let's figure out how we do it, but this is it. Um, and they're not, people are not gonna move to a different facility. So let's figure it out. And that has been the most successful. A lot of it was done in smaller states like Vermont and um, New Hampshire. But um, on the other hand, you know, um, Jerome Miller, for example, um, did it in regards to the whole juvenile detention system in Massachusetts in the 70s. He just closed it down uh, when he was commissioner. So these are just examples from history in which it's totally possible to do that. Um, the second thing is, in my opinion, of things that were successful and we can learn for, from is facility closure that was done by centering the margins, which is a very feminist and intersectional practice. This comes from me. This is not the words of the people who did this work. They didn't use the word feminist or intersectional or praxis. Um, but they really focused on the people with the most complex needs, what they called, or you know, professionals call it the most severe, right? Um, in the prison arena, we can call it the most dangerous. And, you know, this is something I learned from you, Eric. Uh, I mean, the, your work on the sex offender registries, for example. I mean, and, and, um, and Honey Knopp, um, K-N-O-P-P. -P. And when we start from the people that we think, um, you know, when we start not from the nons, you know, the non-violent, the non-dangerous, not severe, the marijuana smoker, um, the person with quote unquote, I hate, I hate these words and I don't subscribe to them, but in the professional literature, mild disabilities, you know, then um, it makes it really hard then to do the actual work of abolition. But when we start from what, at least people perceive to be the most, whatever, severe, dangerous, um, we find then ways of doing things that then would be also helpful for other people. And so that has been a really useful strategy is to kind of start from the severe and center the margins, just as one example. That was great um, engagement. I'm going to pull another um, great question from the Q&A. And this one, I know your book really engages in so many thoughtful ways, is sort of the construct of ableist capitalism and how central um, concepts of, you know, fitness to work and productivity are um, to, and, and the question is, uh, the, the, is specifically related to institutionalization. So how does this element of ableist capitalism stand in the way of complete decarceration? And I'm just gonna turn my video off for a minute so I can turn a light on. <laughs> I'll be back. All right. Um, so um, I think it's really, it's a great question. And I do uh, write about it quite a bit in the book. Um, what it was really interesting to me to think about is not just how incarceration is very profitable, but actually um, decarceration is becoming more and more profitable. And I think that that's the second half to, to your question, um, Erica, is, is how that gets mobilized now. So, which is really sad, but of course we know this from history is once we close something down, a lot of the times another entity comes that was supposed to be an alternative, but is actually a for-profit. And you know, now our people, um, let's say, are housed in, you know, or, or, or let's say not housed even, but electronic monitoring, you know? Uh, and we all know the critiques of, of electronic monitoring. And if people don't know, they should, look at the work of um, James Kilgore, K-I-L-G-O-R-E, 
And so a system that's now for profit is coming to so-called replace the system that was about decarcerating people, right? It was, um, and, and that is the fear I think now with like defunding the police is that, okay, we'll defund the police and then security firms <laughs> will come up and do the work of policing, but for profit. And in a lot of ways that has happened, um, depending on which state and which arena, but it did happen in the institutionalization. You know, there, there um, were for-profit companies, and some of them are exactly the same, by the way, um, like the GEO group. Um, the GEO group is um, a for-profit corporation that um, is for-profit in terms of prisons, but also uh, what they call therapeutic facilities. So we are fighting the same enemies actually in both arenas. Um, so this is not to answer the question, but just you know, kind of affirming that um, yes, this is definitely a, th a thorough line in the book and something we need to be very attentive to, to and attentive to the specificity of because it changes and it keeps changing. Uh, and so I think we need to kind of keep track of it. Someone asks in the chat about how um, your thinking may or may not relate to anarchist praxis, which is really interesting to me in part, and I'll just say just to add my own like part of this question. I think that a lot of times um, in the US, uh, a framework that's used is kind of like, you know, schools, not jails, or like mental health, not jails, or, you know, there's kind of a, a assumption that there's like a positive way the state could um, contain people in various ways or intervene on people in various ways. There's kind of an assumption that there's like a good versus a bad way to intervene, but there's an assumption of that type of authority being part of our lives and we're just replacing the worse version or something. And I think this is a question that can, uh, that is really provoked by anarchist interventions. Um, and I, yeah, I'm not sure if that's what the qu other questioner was thinking, but that just was what made that question me think. And I'm curious like how you've come across that dilemma and that question and um, yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, it definitely comes with some engagement with that. Um, and I'll just give um, two brief examples and maybe you can expand on that being Erica. Um, one is just the notion of prefigurative politics, um, meaning that we create the world we want to see while we're doing it, right? So in relation to the ends and the means, they need to be in, in touch with each other. Um, and I think that that, you know, is something that um, is really important, not just in the way that um, I saw play out, because I'm, I'm not saying these, a lot of these players were anarchists and all what that is necessarily. I don't want to put like stuff in people's minds, but the way that I came to do this book came from like that understanding of politics. Um, and the second thing is these practices of mutual aid that is, as you know, um, both of you are now cropping up <laughs> as if they came from nowhere, um, but they of course came from uh, a lot of places, including very deep, long ago anarchists, you know, organizing and thought and writing and so on and so on. And so, but this idea of mutual aid, um, you know, of course, do play up, um, play out, I'm sorry, uh, as well in this arena of the alternatives, right? So what if not the state? Um, and that is something we also get from disability justice work as well. So I think there's a lot of sources that I'm um, a part of, was inspired by, um, it was very important for me to put in conversation together, but I don't necessarily name them, you know, A or B or C, but um, people can kind of see them uh, in the book and in this kind of analysis. Great, there's another question. Um... Related to schooling um, as a practice of carcerality and 
I think it's a, another sort of strategy question. And I think it lends itself well to the previous question about sort of an anarchist politic or a prefigurative politic. Um, but when the demand is sort of counselors or social workers, not cops, um, how, how do we move? Because it's not, as you've said earlier, that counselors or, or social workers don't um, you know, do the work of policing and, and, um, and the violence of the state. So the question is um, how, you know, it's asking you to sort of think about um, those, those, those movements. Erica, please. I know, it's a great question though. <laughs> it's a great question, one that you've been engaged with for like 30 years, so. <laughs> I'm not that. Five years at least. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm really, I'm curious to, to hear the kind of longitudinal aspect of this question because, you know, I think some of us, um, it's really funny to me that, you know, some of us are, um, you know, becoming like elders in these movements um, at our ripe age of like 40s and 50s. It's funny. Um, but it's not funny because a lot of our people are either dead, um, you know, queer people, queer people of color, disabled people. Um, you know, we die young and we die out of a variety of state violences, including neglect and um, so on. And so, you know, those of us who, and I'm not one of them, um, who kind of come to see the, the long arm of where these conversations are and where the practices are, um, the campaigns are, you know, I think it's really important to kind of learn from that. So I'm not gonna, um, you know, say that this has been something I've been involved in, like, you know, the, the schooling, you know, like even in Chicago public schools or nationally, um, it's not movements that have been a part of um, their campaigns in any intimate way. Um, so again, not a cop out, but I really want to hear what you think. Um, I mean, I think it's sort of the both and struggle, right? Is that um, it depends what you know, I mean, the professionalization, what counselors look like, can we get the, can we get resources to fund peer, young people to support young people? Can we get resources for communities to support themselves, right? So I think, I think that, you know, the slogan is appealing and attractive um, at one level, but I think the, the work is in the, um, what the actual demands are and sort of disaggregating uh, that. So there's so many other good questions though, so I don't need to hear myself. <laughs> but I, I think your book does a really important job of sort of reminding us of um, the sort of, you know, the coerce, the, the, not even coerce, the, the violence of, you know, what we think of as, um, as sort of, uh, as, 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 uh, the violence of health systems. So trying to, um, you know, trying to take a step always and pause before we sign on to social workers. I mean, I have been, particularly under the COVID moment, heartened by so many public health folks coming out as abolitionists and coming out as, um, you know, for getting people out. So I think, um, I think there's, you know, possibilities there that are exciting to me. So I'll just pause there, but move to Dean. Yeah, one of the questions in the Q&A is about us having two white people questioning a white author at this event. And I wondered if you would reflect a bit on like, you know, your book talk uses this race ability frame to really help us think about um, racialized systems of um, disability incarceration, incarceration generally, and that's also happening in the context of there being a really strong whiteness in disability studies. Um, and um, yeah, just like how do you approach um, thinking about that as you as you do the work and and enter these conversations? Yeah, I think you know there's a variety of ways to um, grapple with that. I mean, I think that um, in in the book it was really formative um, for me to learn. 
from a variety of sources that are not necessarily seen as part of you know, what we come to understand as disability studies, disability rights, disability culture, um, and then abolition work. Um, so, you know, th this book really came from um, a lot of mentors um, and the mentors were very uh, different from each other. So I had um, amazing mentors in deinstitutionalization de and disability rights and independent living and disability studies, um, particularly people from the Center on Human Policy at Syracuse University, um, particularly Steve Taylor, um, who uh, also one of the elders that died too young. Um, and you know, there were a lot of them kind of like white cis dudes with beards um, who came to institutions because um, they were hippies and they thought it was wrong um, or they had some connection to like the disability world, not like from their own positionality. Uh, and they taught me a lot actually about activism um, and about history and about doing history and all of that. And then I had a lot of amazing men mentors um, who particularly were um, uh, black women, women of color from the kind of abolition world, uh, black liberation struggles more broadly, uh, particularly Beth Ritchie um, and uh, Angela Davis and a lot of other people. And the book is kind of an attempt to, okay, what if we throw all this together and make soup out of it? You know, like what kind of soup can we make? I love cooking. Um, so, um, you know, I think that that's, it's a very fraught <laughs> experiment. Um, and I hope that it's not an experiment that, um, I mean, I think people can take it to a variety of ways, but it came because it came from me. So I'm not going to kind of change um, who, you know, kind of like the, the roots <laughs> of um, some of the uh, people that I've been in community with in a very, very deep way um, in order to write a book about A or B and C, because I've seen people do that. I think I, it's not. Anyway, we talk about prefiguration. I really do believe in that. And so I try to stay true to a lot of those things and just combine them together. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm very much indebted to your work, Dean and Erica, you know, as, as abolitionists as well, um, to the work of Ruthie Gilmore and Andrea Ritchie and a variety of, of folks. Um, and I think that it's really the uh, amalgamation of all of those things together that enabled me to to create basically this this analysis. Well, we are almost out of time. I wish we weren't because there's so many um, more fabulous things I can ask you about and I still haven't seen the kitten um, that was promised um, earlier in the call. <laughs> but I'm, there's so many great uh, questions in the Q&A chat. Um, and so maybe I'll just, just put a couple out there and then um, one is about the impossibility, impossibility as, a, as a generative starting place for your work. And I think you've pointed to that a couple of times. Um, engaging young people um, or people who might be newer to some of these kind of frames and lenses. So I might ask you to close sort of thinking about, um, you know, impossibility now, Dean's on the call, right, um, as a generative starting place, but also other tools and resources, of course, your fabulous book, right? I think it's such a important book to be engaging an important critical history in this moment but are there um 
organizations, collectives, networks that you um, continue to find generative in this moment that you want to either direct people to for further reading or more resources? Um, just, um, just trying to, to, to end with also pointing, because I know many people that are, um, that are listening and watching are trying to find out other ways to plug in and to um, get connected. Um, great. Um, so uh, I just put in the chat uh, a link to, again, it's, it's my own website, but the intention is not um, necessarily for people to go look at me. But um, in the past few weeks, I created a resource page uh, on the website. Uh, and it lists a lot of organizations. Um, it lists a lot of um, campaigns and um, pages that I think might be of interest to people who are interested in this kind of work. So instead of listing them one by one, um, people can just go to that page and just pick and choose uh, whatever you want. Uh, I also welcome any feedback about um, access, um, you know, about that resource or anything else. There's a few organizations that I think um, Erica and Dean, you were gonna mention or drop in the chat. Um, so I think that that would be uh, good to kind of, you know, finish with some of that as well. Um, I do think that there's amazing work done by young people right now. Um, and what I think is especially heartening is, um, the fact that this generation was kind of born in the struggle, into the struggle through already like an intersectional lens, right? Like through an understanding that things need to be in coalition, that, that you know, it's kind of like a wide angle. Um, and I think things that uh, a lot of people, people who predate us, of course, um, had to fight for, um, they start from that. And so I think it's, it's amazing to see what can happen when that is the starting point of um, a campaign or a platform or uh, a collective. Great, I love, I just put a couple of organizations in the chat and um, Dean did as well. And I know your website has so many more resources as well. Um, I just want to thank you for the work, you know, for the book, for the helpfulness in this political moment, for this conversation, um, also the labor of all of the folks behind the scenes who made this event possible. And just a special shout out to Women and Children First uh, for just being a steadfast container for revolutionary thought over the years. Um, and I just, yeah, I'm deeply appreciative uh, of being here in this nourishing moment um, during this political, political moment. Me too. So grateful to you for this book, Leah. The amount of of research and labor, it's such a tool for our, it's such a rich, complex tool for our movements and, and also really grateful uh, to the interpreters and the captioner and all the people who did the work to make the logistics of this um, event possible so that we could all be here. And thanks to everybody who came and I hope everyone will spread the word about this book. Yeah, and thank you both so much. Bye-bye.